everything looked nice around here, and we appreciate that. So if you have any questions about it, let them know. If you want to drop your kids off for an hour and a half Saturday night and get a break, bring them to the church. And they'll worship the Lord. They'll come back feeling good. It's good to see you guys. God bless you. Poke somebody. Say, wake up. He's going to preach now. We actually got through that last song. And I'm still going to preach. That's a new one. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 in just a moment. I want to talk this morning about confronting the world's philosophies with God's truth. We need, and we've been talking about this for the last several weeks. Coming out of the world system into God's system. In order to do that, Jesus said, I have come to give you truth. And this truth will set you free. In other words, we need to know how to come out of the world system and enter into God's system. I want you all to stand with me, if you would. We're going to read this scripture together. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Faith, would you put it up there? You know it. If you don't, you should know these scriptures. Pray it. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, bless your word. We just come before you with humble hearts this morning. And we need you. We need you to do a miracle in our lives. We need you, God, to transform our minds and our thoughts. And Lord, I pray that all we do and say today will just open up wonderful, wonderful truths into our lives that we can live. Thank you for your wonderful words you have given us, and you taught us how to pray. And we give you honor in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> it's interesting that, you know, we call this the Lord's Prayer, and really it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's a disciple's prayer. Because the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And this is what he did. He said, this is how you pray. And Jesus starts off by saying, by introducing the creator, the deity, in a way that the Israelite people, Jewish people, probably nobody's ever really looked at him before as calling him Heavenly Father. Paul took it a little bit further than that, and he called him Abba Father, which means Daddy Father. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying this This one that we pray to is our provider, and he is our protector. As much as a more so than an earthly father would ever be, he wants to be there to help you out. He wants to be there to minister to you. He wants to be there to encourage you. He wants to take care of your needs. If you really study this thing in the right light, all the words of Jesus was to bring people from a world viewpoint into God's viewpoint. And so he says, look at the father. Look at him as daddy father. And then he says, your kingdom, or first he says, hallowed be your name. In other words, honor his name, honor his word. And then he, then he says to pray this way, pray, your kingdom come and your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God still desires that we experience heaven on earth. He desired that for Adam and Eve in the beginning. He still desires that today. And I want to say something, and it's controversial, and people get angry over this statement. If you get angry over it, don't leave me mentally. Just hang with me because we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to prove it's true, okay? God will allow what we allow by the words that we speak. God allows what we allow by the words that we speak. You say, wasn't God sovereign? Of course he is. But people get angry over this. But if you go back into the Garden of Eden, you look at the whole scenario that took place here, you got to ask the question, Did God allow Adam and Eve to sin? He didn't want them to sin. He told them they shouldn't sin. He told them how they can avoid sin. But they made a choice and they sinned. God allowed that. He wasn't happy with it. It brought destruction to them. He told them not to. But God allowed what Adam allowed. And he allows what we allow. In fact, as a believer... He's allowing things in our life that we're allowing right now. If we can just understand this, Jesus is trying to teach us some things, some kingdom principles. 
things are happening in our life, not necessarily because God wants it to happen. It's because we're not taking our place in bringing the kingdom of God on earth. Pray this prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in my life, on my job, where I'm at, in my marriage, as it is in heaven. Pray that prayer. Ask that it be accomplished. He's allowing things to happen in our lives that we allow. For example, if we want to be broke, you know what? We will be broke. If you want to be poor, you'll be poor. If you want to be sick, you can be sick. If you want to die before your time, you'll die before your time. It never amazes me as I talk to people in this area and just listen to the words that come out of their mouth, how, they're, how they speak, and they're speaking things that are happening in their life, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And, and sometimes people say things that just blow me away, how they, they're satisfied with so little in life. They're satisfied with being poor, and they really believe they're going to be poor the rest of their life, broke, sick. They believe their marriage is going to be in trouble the rest of their life. They go on and on and on. They talk about how, you know, I got a cousin, and I've talked to you about her before. I don't know if she ever listens to our broadcast. I hope she does. <laughs> but she'll call me up every now and then, and she'll say, you know, old Uncle so-and-so's got a heart attack, or somebody else has got a, a cancer, or somebody else has got a tumor. Or, I mean, every time I see, you know, a caller ID, it's here. I know it's something bad. And she'll always say, so-and-so is sick, bad things are happening, and she'll always conclude with, you know this runs in our family. And so you're probably going to get it, too. Don't you love phone calls like that? I'm not going to get it, too. I don't care if it runs in my family. I don't care if everybody in my family dies of a heart attack. I am not going to die of a heart attack. I don't care what they say. My God holds my days in his hands. And I'm going to live until God says that's enough. And, in fact, I'm going to live until I die. That's what I figured. <laughs> Every day, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to worry about these things. But sometimes we allow things to happen because we, we say, well, it runs in my family. You know, marriages fall apart in my family. Well, nobody can stay together in my family. Well, people get sick in my family. And we, we really are, are allowing ourselves to prophesy into our lives what's going to take place in the negative sense. Jesus said that blessings can be ours, but we have to ask for them. Somewhere along the line, as a Christian, you and I need to stand up and say to the enemy of our soul, I am not going to allow you to steal from my family anymore. I'm not going to allow you to steal from my health anymore. I'm not going to allow you to take away my joy, my happiness in life. I'm going to take a stand against it. I'm going to begin to proclaim blessings over my life and over my job and over my family and over my finances. And when we do that, we will defeat the powers of darkness. That's the whole mindset of coming out of the world system and coming into God's system. God gave man authority on this earth. When God created, uh, created the earth and he put man on this earth, he said, I give you authority. I give you dominion, is the words he said. And over all the, the, the world, go and, and subdue it. And we know that Adam had that. And, and to understand this, to understand where we're going here. Adam and Eve had that. In fact, I was listening, we were listening this last week to a, a guy talk about this, how, you know, all the animals came before Adam and he named them all. And the guy that was speaking, you remember what he said? He said when he got, he kind of got tired apparently towards the end because rather than calling a rhinoceros or an elephant or whatever, he just called one like a bluebird or a red bird or a blackbird. You know, he just, he just kind of narrowed it down. Yeah, it's, that, it's red, so it's called a red bird or whatever. But he, he named all the animals of the earth. He had all that authority. And then along comes a temptation, and he gave all that authority away when he sinned. He gave it to the devil. And the Bible talks about this in several places. It talks about how Satan rules the world. Jesus understood that because the temptation that came to him, Satan said, I'll give you all the authority of this world if you bow down to me. And Jesus said, I'm not going to bow down to you. I'm going to take that authority away by means of the cross. And so Satan had all this authority, deceiving all these people. He set up this whole thing called the world system. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and when he was crucified, on the cross, he defeated the powers of darkness. He defeated Satan. He took away his authority. He took away his power. And the Bible says, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said these things to his disciples and to us. He said, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So man had authority over this planet. 
He gave it up to the devil. And for thousands of years, the devil ruled and reigned. The devil offered it to Jesus if Jesus would bow down and let him continue to be the king. But when Jesus died on the cross and he, he cried out that, that cry where he said, it is finished, it was not a, a defeated cry, it was a victor's cry. It was finished is that he defeated the powers of darkness on the cross and then he comes to his disciples he says, now I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. I want you to go and do something with that authority and that power. Not just sit on it, I want you to take it out and do something with it. You need to go forth and pray. You need to ask. You need to say things. You need to speak things. The kingdom of God, operating in the kingdom of God is just proclaiming God what God proclaims over things. Here's what we have a tendency to do. To back up and say, well, I guess whatever is going to be, it's just going to be. We have this tendency to say, well, apparently God's working everything in my life, so I'm just going to let things happen. No, you need to pray over your family. You need to pray over your job. You need to pray over your future. Because God will allow what we allow. Just look around. You see that is true. God will allow our neighborhoods to be run over. He will allow drugs to take over our streets. He will allow... Us Thieves to come and steal away from us, our, our possessions, our cars, even our children. Whatever we allow, God allows, whether it's good or bad. So we need to see this, that God has placed in our laps a responsibility. And that is to pray for things. And to proclaim things. And to bring victory into our lives, into people's lives, by how we act, what we believe, what we think, and what we speak. So let's look at our, if you have your notes, let's look at our outline here. The first thing is this. Some teachings about the kingdom of God. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul said, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. Philosophy is a mentality of mankind. It's a, it's a belief system of humanity. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of this world, in other words, World, what, in other words, what this world system believes, and not according to Christ. We need to understand how God's system works, and we need to confront the world's philosophies so that we can have what Jesus said we could have, that's abundant life. Here's a couple things. You know, we can't cover everything in one sermon. It just takes forever to go through all these. But here's a couple things. Misconception concerning God. One is this. God makes people suffer. And he's trying to teach you something through your suffering. <clears throat> God makes people suffer. If you believe that, you will never pray effectively. You see, the devil, he comes up, and again, the Bible talks about this so many times. The devil comes up, and he is the one who accuses you before God. He condemns you before God. Have you ever heard of karma? Don't raise your hand, but hopefully you don't believe in karma. You know why? Because karma says you get what you deserve in life. The reason why everything bad is happening to you is because of something you did when you were younger. And all of us have a past. We can all look back and say, man, if only I hadn't made that choice. If only I hadn't have done that. If only I did things different in my life. Oftentimes think, if only I could just take my body, myself, and go back and talk to me and pull myself up by the shoulders and say, do not make that mistake. If only I could go back when I, and tell myself when I was younger, don't make those choices, how much different life would be. But we all have a history. We all have a past. Here's what the devil does. He comes along and he'll say, you know what? The reason why you're sick today, the reason why your marriage is falling apart today, the reason why your finances are like they are today, the reason why God does not bless you today is because of all the horrible things you did in the past. After all, isn't that what karma is? You deserve to be punished for everything you did in the past. And you know what the world's philosophy does? It comes along and reinforces that over and over and over again. Everything in the world says, yeah, you're a result of all the choices you make. Here's something that's different to the Christian. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he says he took our sins away completely. Sins is all of our past mistakes, all of our past failures, all these things, and he took them away. God said... 
He took our sins and he removed them as far as the east is from the west. He buried our sins in the deepest sea, never to be remembered again. If you were to walk up into the throne room of God today and you would say, God, do you remember when I did this, when I failed in that area? Do you remember when I failed in that area? You remember when I let you down here? You remember those dumb mistakes I went, I, I performed back then? You know what God would say? It's the only thing that he would say in, in remembering things, he says, I don't remember that. But it actually happened. God, how can you not remember? Because God has chosen to not remember your sins. If we can get that into our hearts and into our spirit, it changes everything about who we are as human beings. God does not punish you over and over and over again because of past sins. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, so you do not have to be crucified. And that's that thing called righteousness that he has placed in your life. I don't, have to, I don't have to pay the penalty of all those bad things I've done. There are consequences, of course, but as far as God is concerned, he's not holding this thing over me and saying, I'm not going to bless you until you do enough penance. You see, I've done this before. I've told people in church, I say, if you go and run around the church a few times, God's going to bless you. You know what people do? They'll get up and run around the church. It doesn't matter. You tell people, I've heard people do, I've never done this, say, you know, you're giving the offering, give me $100 and God's going to bless you. You can't buy God's blessing. In fact, don't ever do that. If anybody asks you to do that, I'm telling you, don't give. Because God's blessings are free. Eternal life is free. Forgiveness is free. He wants to give it to you. And so that's a misconception, and the devil will come to condemn you and to criticize you and to put you down and to hold all those things over your head. He'll even tell you that you're being tempted, you know, and it's just God somehow or another trying to make you stronger. We just read that scripture. We prayed the prayer. Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In James 1.13, the Bible says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he he himself tempt anyone. God is not in the temptation business. You don't grow stronger by being tempted. Jesus said, pray that you not be tempted. God is a good God. He loves you, and he desires you to succeed. i got to move on, man. I'm taking too long in this. Well, you don't know how much I have. Don't say no. I, I already split this thing in half. I'm going to preach the second half tonight, okay? I may preach two-thirds of it tonight. Teachings about the kingdom of God, things we misunderstand, is understand this saying of the principle of prosperity, so greatly misunderstood in the church. Jesus taught us how to distinguish between wealth of this world and the wealth of the kingdom. In Luke chapter 12, verse 22, he says, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food, the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value of you, are you than of those birds? Verse 30, he says, For these things the, nation, uh, the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. We were sitting in the minister's conference this last week. And, and I was sitting by a couple of pastors. And, and uh, the, the speaker was going on. He said, now, now he says uh, something about, you know, tell, tell somebody next to you, you're not going to worry. And I, I leaned over and I said, I, I don't worry about anything. And, and the pastor looked at me and said, you don't worry about anything? I said, I honestly don't worry about anything. Well, how can you not worry about anything? Because the Bible says, be anxious for nothing and pray about everything. And I honestly don't worry about anything because it's in God's hand. I pray. I don't let things just go on, whatever it's going to be. I pray, and by faith, I believe God's going to take care of it. And I'm not going to worry about it. I go to bed at night. I can go to sleep in a minute's time. I wake up in the morning. It's a brand new day. And whatever is going to face me that day, I know God has it all under control. And I'm not just saying, you know, what's going to be is going to be. I say, God, these are things that I'm praying into existence. I'm praying for these things to take place, and I'm allowing God to take care of those things. Can you live a life worry-free? Jesus said, don't worry about these things. Why? Because worry is how the world operates. Worry is saying, how am I going to survive in life? How am I going to make it 
you know, an income and take care of my family. Worry keeps on saying, you know, I've got to do certain things. I've got to figure life out. I've got to manipulate things. And people get into that whole mold and, and they begin to do all the wrong things. Rather than saying, Father, I believe in you. You're going to take care of all my need. I know you're going to take care of this situation. And I'm trusting you. And the whole concept, again, is that we trust God and not the world. We trust God and not ourselves. We trust God and not our own intellect. We trust the Lord. We realize that in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, there's more than enough. He has all the resources we will ever need for anything we face in life. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. He says, God takes care of those little animals out there. You're more important than those animals. God will take care of you as well. When Jesus was preaching one day, and he did this on two different occasions, but on one time he was preaching to 5,000 people. And uh, the disciples said, you know, everybody's hungry. What are we going to do? Jesus said, you feed them. And they looked at each other and said, we don't have anything. <laughs> we said, well, find something. And they got a little boy here. He's got, you know, some fish and loaves. Well, there's nothing amongst all these people. And Jesus said, take it. Let me bless it. You distribute it. The Bible says everybody was fed. And they were all fed. The whole scenario that took place here, Jesus was taking them out of the mindset of the world into the mindset of the kingdom. And he was trying to tell them, he said, what you see is not all there is. There's more to it than what you see. There's more to this thing. There is an invisible, inexhaustible, heavenly supply that comes from God. The kingdom of God comes inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's there to provide for all of our needs. The Bible says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not how much I can feed you, how much I can take care of myself. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus is trying to get us to understand there's a new form of government. We're not underneath the old government anymore. We're underneath the kingdom of God. For the believer, for the person who, who trusts in the Lord, we have more than enough. And he says he provides joy. Friend, he'll provide joy when the whole world is sorrowful. He'll provide peace when everybody else is upset. He'll provide love when people are filled with hatred. Ephesians 1, 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed with everything you have need of. Second thing is this. We need to switch from the world system to the kingdom of God. Jesus told his disciples, Matthew chapter 16, when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread, and Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware that the leaven of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourself because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand? Do you not yet understand? Or remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves and the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware that he did of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not Tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, even after Jesus had shown them physically what the kingdom of God was all about, the supernatural kingdom, when he's trying to explain them some more things about the spiritual world, they say, well, the world system, we didn't bring any bread. He wasn't talking about bread. He's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees who were hypocrites, put laws, rules, and regulations on people. The Sadducees, who had great intellect, who are always trying to find more of God through knowledge. He says, beware of those things, because both those things are the world system. They're always works-oriented. And Jesus was saying, put those things aside. That's the world system. Embrace God's system. Number three. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, he had just given them a parable of the sower. And he said, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parable, 
The farmer plants a seed by taking God's word to others. Jesus was saying this is the foundation of all other parables. If you want to understand the kingdom of God, he said, if you don't understand this one, you won't understand any of them. The sower sows a seed. The farmer plants a seed. You farmers all understand how this thing works. You plant seeds your whole life. You see how this thing works. And Jesus brings this thing into the spiritual sense. He said, the word of God, this thing right here, is like that seed that's planted into your life. You know, it's interesting to me that the world today is challenging us on many levels. It challenges the Christian, number one, just the fact that you're a Christian. The world challenges you. Thinks you're uneducated. You're unlearned. How can you possibly believe those things? Challenges the reality of Jesus Christ, whether or not he even existed. And they always try to put some kind of negative slant on Jesus, which is interesting because they don't put a negative slant on any other religious leaders, but Jesus they do. And lately they're challenging this thing right here, the Word of God. Non-stop. Why are they challenging the Word of God? The devil doesn't like it when people get this thing into their hearts. He doesn't like it when you begin to understand what the Word of God is all about and what it means and how powerful the Word of God is. The Bible says it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and goes to the very thought and the intent of the heart. It is a powerful, powerful force. In fact, this thing is the most powerful force we have available to us today. But yet, as Christians, so often we take it lightly. We lay it aside. We don't get it down into our spirit. And Jesus was saying about this parable, so you've got to understand this parable to understand anything else that's going to happen. I'm going to teach you any other parable or anything else about the kingdom of God. You need to understand that the word is that seed that's planted in your life, and it's powerful. In the beginning, the very first uh, part of Genesis, the Bible says that God looked upon nothingness, and he said, let there be light. And you know what happened? Light appeared before the sun, before the moon, before the planets, before anything, light appeared. Why? Because God spoke the word. He spoke the word. That's how powerful the word is. He said, let there be light. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Get that in our spirit. When God speaks, everything changes. And he says, let there be light. And, and he, the word established. It formed. It changed the natural world. Everything changed in our lives, must line up with what the Word of God says. This Word is more powerful than your thoughts. It's more powerful than anything you're going through in your life. The Bible says, even when our hearts condemn us, our God is greater than our hearts. This Word is a seed that can be planted in your life, and it's such a powerful thing, it will remove anything that is in its way, even when it looks like it's not working, friend, you've got to stand on the Word of God. Even when it looks like your whole world's falling apart, you still stand on the promises of God's provision in your life. Even though it looks like you're not going to make it in life, God says you're going to make it in life, and you continue to stand on that. You keep confessing it. You keep declaring it. You keep proclaiming it. You keep the Word forefront in your life and believe God from the impossible. And you know what? God will do wonderful things in your life. The word of God, as high as he exalted his name, the Bible says he exalted his word even above his name. Sometimes people tend to think, because it's not working right now, it's never going to work. But the truth is, everything has to yield to the word of God. If you plant the word seed, and even if that is covered up by cement, that word is strong enough to go right through that pavement, right through that cement, and continue to go forth and grow. The Word of God is the most powerful thing we have as a tool from the Lord. And Jesus came and said, I'm going to give you my words. I'm going to teach you my words. I'm going to give you the words of heaven. I'm going to show you the way that you can operate in this world and be successful. And if we plant the Word, God says it will grow. And everything, say everything must submit to the authority and the power of the Word of God. Everything. God wants us to realize that the Word of God is the final authority. If God said it, I believe it, that settles it. 
That means it's not the news that dictates my life. It's not what people say that dictates my life. It's not the thought of the day that dictates my life. It's not my circumstances that dictate my life. It's what the Word of God says that dictates my life. If God's Word is true, I believe it. I will stand on the Word of God, and God is going to fulfill His Word in my life. What is it you have need of? Consider just for a moment. Where are you at? What do you need? you need help in your finances? My God says... He is able to take care of your need according to his eternal riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is not poor. There's enough blessings to go around for everybody. What is it you have need of? You need your family to come back together. You need your marriage to be healed up. God said that he put man and woman together and he looked at it and he said, it's good. It's good. And if God said it's good, nobody can say it's bad. And you need to say the same thing. My marriage is good. My marriage is good. It's a good marriage because God put his stamp of approval on my marriage. What is it you had need of? You want your children to come to the Lord? The Bible says that you will be saved and your household. That's what the Word of God says. You stand on the Word of God. You need deliverance in your life over addiction. My God says that he will set us free and break every chain and every bondage that's in our life if we'll just come to him and submit to him. Whatever you have need of, God says, I will give it to you. He does, he's not against you, and he doesn't want to hold anything back from you. He has blessings more than you can possibly imagine for you. But we have to make the choice. We have to step out of the world system, and we have to step into God's system. He said, God, I trust you. See, the whole thing is, it, 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 it kind of boils down into simplistic things, and at least in my little mind it does. God says, I want to bless you. You know, it's like the old story. The guy died and went to heaven, and angels are showing him around and showing him this huge warehouse just filled with all kinds of wonderful things. And the guy says, what's all this about? How come, how come all these things are here in heaven, all these wonderful things I could have used on earth? And the angel said, well, these are things that God wanted you to have, but you never asked for them. <laughs> God has so many wonderful things he wants to give you, but we have to ask. And here's, you say, why should I pray? Why do we have to ask? Because the whole thing is, I'm getting my mind off the world. I'm not asking the world for anything. I don't want the government to take care of me. I don't even want my job to take care of me. I don't want my employer to take care of me. I want to go walk over here and say, God, you will take care of me. You will take care of me. And if God takes care of me, it doesn't matter if the world falls apart, the government falls apart, my job falls apart, or anything else. I still have my confidence and trust in the Lord. You see, when God brought man into the Garden of Eden, he said, I'm going to give you work to do. Work. Not a job. Adam, Eve, you have work to do. We still have work to do. And that work is whether we're here in Cornelius or we live in Hillsboro or we live in Forest Grove or you live in the wonderful town of Gaston, which I live in. God lives there too. God's got a special blessing on Gaston. For all three of us that live there, God loves us. But wherever we're at, wherever we're doing, whether you're on the job, you're in the store like my wife was, you have a work to do. You have a work, God's given you work. And as long as you're doing your work that he's given you to do, he says, I'll take care of every single need you have. I will bless you no matter what it is that you have need of. And we walk around all day long just wringing our hands. Anybody ever do that? Stop wringing your hands. God has it in control. Just trust him. Just believe him. Just say like I did to that woman the other day. I said, I don't worry about anything. And I don't worry about anything. I've learned that my God will supply more than I could possibly ever imagine in life. He is bigger than any problem I've ever faced. He's bigger than any obstacle. He's bigger than any devil that's ever come against me. I'm going to tell you a short story. They want to close, okay? See, God is bigger than any force that can come against you. When I was down in Ventura, California, we, my wife and I passed a little church down there, and we had this young girl that came in. And, and, and I first saw her when I was walking into the office. I saw, I didn't know it was a girl. I thought it was a boy sitting over here on the, on the step. And, and uh, I got in my office, and it was a young girl. She come in, and she sat down, and she said, I need to talk to you. And I said, what is it? And she told me about this cult that she was involved in. Actually, it was the occult. We're coming around Halloween time, so you understand this. She said, I was involved in the occult. My mother is a, is a high priestess of the Church of Satan in, in San Francisco. And she worked hand-in-hand hand with Anton LaVey at that time, who had the Church of Satan. And she says, I want out. She says, I want out of this thing, but they told me I can't get out. 
And I'm asking for somebody to help me out. And of course, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I said, oh, yeah, I can help you. No idea what I was getting into. This woman was connected with the most horrible people on the planet. Drug dealers. I mean, these, there's one time, because we tried to help her out, there's one time that I was on a bowling league back then. And uh, Saturday night we were bowling, and I turned around, and I saw 200 people all dressed in black standing there just looking at me all from this occult group threatening us. We used to get threatening phone calls all the time, people cussing us out. And One time I went outside on my garage door, painted in blood was death to the weak. And another time I opened up the door and here's a black box and inside of it were four dead rats. And they put a curse on me. The curse on me was that I was going to be driven out of that community and then I was going to die. That's a curse they put on me. Now, <clears throat> nobody wants to see that. And the devil's going to come along, he's going to whisper in your ear. See, the, the devil's going to say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy your children. I'm going to destroy your ministry. You know what I did? I went to church every day. And I took this thing right here, this book. Every day, and I opened it up, and I began to put myself into it as I read it. In the book of Psalms, and right on through, I, I personalized these prayers to be my prayers. To God, I need your help. I'm dealing with forces here that are beyond me. I'm dealing with people that are honoring me. They're mean. They want to kill me. They want to kill my kids. They used to follow my kids to school. I said, God, I'm just trying to do your will. And I just began to pray this thing, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. You know what happened? Word came back to me <clears throat> that this, this woman, who was this girl that I helped her mother, who was involved in that, that satanic church, she... The, the, all of a sudden, the FBI came after her and her boyfriend because they were dealing with drugs from San Francisco down to the Ventura area. And so they left. They went to Spain. And while they were in Spain, uh, she, she wasn't seen for a few days. And so they finally found her. She was in her room, and she had died. And uh, the curse that she put on me, that I had to leave that community and I was going to die, she had to leave her community, and she did die. Whoa, right. All of a sudden, all that harassment stopped. You see, when you go through things like that, you realize your God is greater than any force of hell. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and you don't have any fear of evil. You don't worry about anything. God is greater than every demon that can come against you. He's greater than the power of the enemy. He's greater than people that threaten your life. He's greater than anything, but you have to seek the kingdom. You have to get the word of God down into your heart and into your spirit and let it grow inside of you and trust God. You're not in the world system anymore. You're in God's system now. He will never disappoint you. And here's something else the devil does. He will come to you and he'll tell you that you are a failure. He will tell you that you will never succeed in life. He will give all these thoughts in your mind about how you've done so many bad things in your life and he'll beat you up with those things over and over and over again. He'll do that. And he'll try to program your mind into thinking that you're some kind of worthless human being because that's how he keeps people in slavery. But when Jesus comes, he changes all those thoughts. He arranges all those thoughts. He begins to formulate an image of Christ inside of you. Jesus is inside of you. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. You are not some wretched sinner saved by grace. You were a wretched sinner, but now you're saved by grace. There's a difference. You are now a child of the Most High God. You're a child of the King. You walk with your head held high. God has placed authority and power in your life. And when you walk into a situation, you are not controlled by the situation. You control the situation. Circumstances have to bow before what God desires you to do in your life. You can bring authority and power wherever you're at, and you can change the world just like God said, let there be, and there was. You can do the same thing. Let there be blessings in my life. Blessings will come. Let there be prosperity that come into my life. Prosperity will come. Let every enemy that has come against me fall. The Bible says they'll come at you in one way, but they'll run in seven different ways. A thousand will fall on your right hand and ten thousand on your left, but not one hair on your head will be touched because you are a child of God. you got angels all around about you. 
all around about you. You have to believe that. You have to walk in that. This is what God has placed in us. This is the kingdom authority. Kingdom authority. This is the kingdom walk that he has placed us in, his system. Man, if we ever get a hold of that, we will never go back into the world. We'll have no interest in what the world has to offer. Because all it is is failure. The devil says you're a loser. God says you're a winner. Poke your neighbor says you're a winner. And you're awake now, too, because he's coming to a close. You're a winner. And Jesus tells his disciples, you know, everybody's all wondering when Jesus is coming back. I don't know when he's coming back. No idea. I've never predicted the return of Christ. I never will. Because the disciples went to Jesus and said, when are you coming back? He says, it's not important that you know, but occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. We're still here. Occupy in the power of the kingdom of God until Jesus comes back for us. And he is coming back. Don't know when, but he's coming back. But until that time, I have a work to do. You have work to do. You have work to do. All right, I'm going to close. I want you to pray with me. Father, I just want to honor you this morning. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit and the power of your kingdom will come into our situation right now. And I call upon the angels of the Lord to come forth and minister. You said you have ministering angels. Ministering angels. Lord, I ask that you come and touch people in the hour of need right now. Touch them right now where they're at. There's those that are here this morning, Lord, they have such a low opinion of themselves. God, would you change that? Change their thoughts. Change their hearts. May they see what you see. They are your children. They are your children. Father, I pray that you just raise them up right now. My God, raise them up in the name of Jesus. Raise them up right now. Savior, you can move mountains. You can move mountains. You can move mountains. And I believe you. You're going to move those mountains. Roseanne, I need you to come if you would. Let me just say a word of encouragement if I can to somebody here this morning. Your future in your mind looks very bleak. You just wonder, God, what's happening? Doors have not opened up. Things have not happened like I thought they should or they would. It's just like, I don't know what's happening in my life. I'm confused. I'm frustrated. I just, I just wonder, where should I go? I just want to encourage you this morning. God has a door open for you. God has a plan for your life. God knows what he's doing with you. And at this moment, you may not understand it. You may not see it. But when it happens, when it happens, all of a sudden it's going to become clear to you. You're just going to see and say, yes, this is why I've been waiting all this time. This is why I've been waiting. And my encouragement to you is this. Do not faint in doing good. Do not faint. Do not lose heart. For God's going to open that door for you. He is going to take care of you. There are going to be blessings that will come into your life that are going to literally overtake you. So wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. How long? I don't know. But when it happens, you will know. And this is what this saying, faith, is all about. You just trust in Him. You just trust in Him. God has that right job for you. God has that right person for you. God has that right opportunity for you. God knows what he's doing. God's going to bring your children back to the Lord. He's going to touch your grandchildren. He's going to bring them back to the Lord. God's going to touch your mind. He's going to change all those negative thoughts that you have about you. And he's going to change him into thoughts about who you are in Christ Jesus. He's going to, he's going to do something new in your life. He's going to do something new in your life. I believe that. You just need to trust him. You need to just not look at the world and say, how am I going to work this thing out? Just leave that alone. Say, God, I'm trying.
trust in you. When Jesus said, you can say to mountain, be removed, it will be cast into the sea. Once you say it, you leave it alone. Let him take care of the details. Let him take care of the details. He's going to help you. He's going to help you. I trust that you be encouraged by that this morning.